Welcome to You Don't Know Ball. Today, we are going to be going over our top 15 rankings for all offensive skill positions going into the season. We're going to start off with quarterbacks. As always, if you don't know ball and want to know ball, be sure to subscribe. Leave a like. Let us know in the comments who you think is the number one at quarterback this year, running back, wide receiver, and tight end. Dobbs, I'll let you start it off. At number 15, who do you have as the 15th ranked quarterback? So I have Kyler Murray right here, bro. And my reasoning for having Kyler here is, look, again, it's kind of like, you know, you, you might be saying to yourself, oh, having him at 15 is a little bit low after. Again, we've seen what Kyler can do, you know. We've seen the, the you know, there's been first half of the seasons where the man has put up MVP-like numbers. And then there's that Cliff Kingsbury fall from the second season. And then obviously we haven't seen him fully healthy for about, you know, a year and a half, two years now. So it, it's bound to be that he's going to fall a little bit in the list. But the reality of the situation is, is it's not really an indictment on him. It's just more the injury situation. And there's going to be a few more guys on the list among, you know, different positions groups where it's going to be the same story. Like, I can only put you so high if you have recent injury history. But Kyler, one of those guys where, look, by the end of the year, he could easily be finishing this top 10 range. I just didn't feel comfortable moving him up, you know, too far, given the injury history. But again, we know a Kyler Murray, a guy who has big play written all over him. He can run the ball. He can do it all. It's really just a matter of him getting back into that range, getting healthy, getting acclimated with the new coaching staff. And the truth is, if he can, the sky's the limit, as he's already showed us. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think Kyler Murray may be one of the bigger um, I don't want to say boom or bust candidates on this list. Like we kind of know where he's going to be on the low end of play, but when it comes to high end, I mean, he had a number one option in nuke, but that was kind of when they were still kind of going through some turmoil in the coaching and front office situation. Things seem to be a little bit more stable now in Arizona, and they added a true number one weapon in Marvin Harrison Jr. You know, Trey McBride started to emerge last year. You get James Conner back. Um, you get Trey Benson, who can be another uh, help in the backfield, and we start to see this offensive line possibly take a step forward. Um, and it just gives Kyler Murray so much more room to work in the offense. And, you know, Kyler Murray is still a relatively young quarterback. We don't even know if we've seen the ceiling of Kyler Murray's play. And I think arguably this may be one of the better situations um, put in front of Kyler throughout his career. Moving into number 14, Dobbs, who do you have? 14, I have Trevor Lawrence. And, you know, I would say T-Law is one of those guys who's making a little bit of a plunge from where we had him last year. I know, if I'm not mistaken, I think me and you both had him top five to seven last year. Look, the reality is this. Did his receivers drop a lot of balls? Did they leave a lot of plays on the field for him? Absolutely. But with that being said, does Trevor also need to step up and become more of a big play machine and to get back to how we started to see that transition right into that playoff, right right when they, you know, they were going crazy on the Chargers? Yes, we need to see him get back to that because last season certainly wasn't that same mode, regardless of the drops, regardless of anything else. He's got to get more comfortable again. And it's not, not, not all his fault. That O-line has got to support him better. He's got to stand taller in that pocket. If he can get back to doing that again, you know, again, the ceiling is still incredibly high for Trevor Lawrence. It's just based off of last year's play. I didn't feel comfortable putting him any higher than 14 because truthfully, as we're, you know, as we're saying, there, there was a drop off in play last year. And I'm only ranking off of what I know from last year going into this year. Like, just like, just like I said about Kyler, Trevor Lawrence, one of those guys that can make a much bigger jump. He could end up anywhere between like 10 to six, maybe even higher if he has a fantastic year this year. But from, from what I saw last year, I felt comfortable putting him right here at 14. So I had Trevor Lawrence at 13, so only one spot higher. Uh, you know I've been a pretty big fan of T-Law these last couple years, just kind of because of what he's been able to do. Um, but with that being said, I think they made the additions needed in order for him to kind of show up. I think my issue is they gave them the, he, the receivers he needs, but also like, you can make the argument that there's no like dominant number one in there. And Brian Thomas Jr. may take some time to adjust to the league as all rookies do. So I think the biggest thing for me is if Doug Peterson is going to take play calling duties back from Press Taylor, which is kind of what we talked a little bit about with Jordan. Um, because we just watched the Jaguars offense last year and it just looked 
disjointed from what it was a year prior. Um, I do think, obviously, like you mentioned, the O-line, I think they shirred up the interior a little bit. And I think it should give Trevor um, the best chance to succeed this year. I think, yes, they did lose Zay Jones. Now they have Christian Kirk, Brian Thomas Jr., and Gabe Davis. I think that's plenty to work with. And let's not forget Evan Ingram, one of the better tight ends in the league. So he's had 4,000 yards these last two years. Trevor Lawrence should have another productive year, but we're kind of waiting for that over-the-top season. And I think he may be poised to do it if, you know, Doug Peterson is calling the plays again. No, yeah. If Doug, if Doug takes the plays back, I think that's definitely the first thing that's going to really turn the tide for the Jaguars. And again, as we know, it's a, it's a make-or-break year for a lot of names in that building. Uh, the Jaguars have got to make a jump this year that they didn't make last year. And if they don't, there's going to be a lot of questions we have to answer. Going into number 13, Dobbs, who do you have? I got Tua Tagovailoa. And you know what? This is one where, you know, I know a lot of Dolphins fans aren't going to be happy with me. But it's just, and let me explain. Because you're saying to yourself, okay, dude, Tua just came off of by far his best season, led the league in passing yards. You know, how are we going to have him lower than some of these other names? Well, the reality is this. Look, again, and I don't want to come off like recency bias. It's not just because of the playoff game at all. It's not just because of the playoff game. I think it's a combination of we've seen that sometimes Tua has a tendency to kind of not, I'll say fall off, fall off in some bigger games. And on top of that, he also is working with one of the best cores, or he was last year, and still in the NFL. So I have to kind of like mitigate that a little bit in. And you know what? Again, the truth of the matter is it kind of more than anything. Yeah, like the playoff game does have a big implication on where I ranked him because that's really when I see Tua step up and really ball out in a big game, I think I'll have a, I'll have more of a different tune about him. But as of right now, it's kind of just where it stands. Like, you know, Tua, he, he played really good ball last year for the majority of the year. But the reality is he played with the one of the best receiving cores, you know, if not the best last year. And that has to be accounted for somewhere in the rankings. So I felt comfortable slotting him right here at 13 for those reasons. So Dolphins fans may hate me. I don't even have him on my top 15 list. So looking at all the guys that I have on my list, those are guys that the teams that teams that have these guys have paid. What is a big thing with Tua right now? They have not come out and paid him yet. Yes, T-Law hasn't been paid yet, but the reality is they're going to give him 50 M's. Like, that's just the reality of it. I think giving Tua that next contract is a little bit more controversial than giving T-Law that next contract. And my thing is, like you said, he's got one of the best receiving cores in the league. He has one of the better play callers in the league. I just, watching him, if he didn't have one of those two, I struggle to see how he is a top 15 quarterback, right? So... I just think all the guys that we have on my list or you have on your list are better than Tua as a quarterback as a whole. So I think going into this year, if he does not play well, I think the view of Tua kind of drops quite a bit. So that, that's why I didn't have him on my list. See, again, completely understandable. I think, again, credit. I'm going to credit him where it's due. In structure last year, he played really good ball, and I wanted to give him credit for that. But to your point, look, working with the best, with the best receiving core, if you know, one of, if not the best, one of the best coaching staffs. And if not the best, you know, besides Shanahan, he's one of the best offensive play callers. And yeah, he's been working with a lot is the bottom line. So when you work with a lot, we have to credit into your ranking. That's just kind of the bottom line. So I'll do my 14 then, because I don't believe you had him on your list before we go, go on. Um, I had Kirk cousins at 14, because, he was right at 16 for me. He got slotted out just, just by one. Yeah, so I, I had Kirk Cousins, and the reason I have him is because he was playing top 10 ball last year before he tore his Achilles, and you could almost make the argument that the Falcons' offense is more stacked than – I don't know. It, it's, a tough, it's a tough one. Uh, you know, you have a better play caller – in Minnesota, I think obviously the number one option and even the number two option may be better in Minnesota. But, you know, you have the offensive line. You have Bijan Robinson, who I think the Vikings struggled a lot last year with the run game. Obviously, you add Aaron Jones. He is a little bit older. But at the same time, he is still a productive back. You have Drake London, who I think is poised for a breakout year. I think Kyle Pitts um, might be dug out of the grave by um, Zach Robinson. So, you have a good offensive line. I think Kirk is one of those guys who, yes, he is older. Yes, he's coming off an Achilles tear. 
But at the same time, when did we ever talk about Kirk's mobility? You know, it, it, he's always been a statue in the pocket, and that's what he's going to continue to be. And I just think the change of scenery is going to be good for him. Now, who knows? Because Kevin O'Connell really turned Kirk into something special. Do we, Are we all that confident that Zach Robinson can do the same thing? He's got the weapons. He's got the line. It's very possible. But it is still a little bit of an unknown factor. I think I just trust Kirk Cousins a little bit because of his stability over the last couple of years. See, and that was, that's really the only, the reality is I would have had him on the list. I just, he was teetering right there around like 13 to 15 and coming off of a big injury. That's just the only thing that drove him down my, my rankings just a little bit, but yeah. I completely understand where you're coming from. He definitely was, he was right there. You know, he was, he was right there and I felt bad leaving him off. I truly did. So but I'm going to, I'm going to walk he has back a lot to my, prove, uh, you know, I'm going to walk back my better supporting cast argument It is definitely Minnesota, but Atlanta still is pretty good on offense. No, they got a damn good supporting cast for them also. There's definitely no <laughs> doubt about that. If they can just yeah. all stay healthy, they can keep Art Smith out the building, which they they finally figured out, you know, Art Smith's out. So I think that the, these offensive playmakers are ready to get going. And we're going to see a whole new world in Atlanta this year. I know Falcons fans are excited. Going into number 12, Dobbs, who do you have? All right, so for number 12, I have Jared Goff. And I will be honest, you know, this is one of those ones where I struggled with where I'm thinking to myself, you know, did I put Jared Goff maybe a little bit too low after the season you just had last year? But my thought process when I'm doing this, these rankings and, and for every position, you'll see it kind of it'll come together. It's very hard because you have to not only equate like how good of the season they had last year is, but you also have to kind of equate what you already know about them, their flaws, their tendencies, how much faith you have for that season to carry over and progress from the last season. And you know, because we look at Jared Goff, we're like, okay, he's coming off the best year of his career, right? So, or, or you could argue, but one of the two best years of his career. And it's like, do I think he's going to necessarily improve off of that? Or is that kind of his ceiling? And on top of that, if, if that's his ceiling, it's like, the, does he rank above these other guys? Like, it was just very tough. The bottom line is Jared Goff has established himself as one of the better QBs in the league. He's shown that in structure within a good offense, he can play very good ball, which is what he's been doing in Detroit. And... You know what? A lot of people doubted him. I doubted him. He's come back. He's proven himself. I think it's just in terms of ceiling, I just don't see him as a higher ceiling than the guys that I have ranked above him. But you know what? The reality is you could argue that for definitely a couple of these guys. So you know what? It's It gets dicey. It really passed past 12, 11. It starts getting really hard to rank these guys until you get into like the top three or four. So it's like Lions fans don't take too much offense. I know Jared Goff's your guy as he should be. It just, it was hard to like where I should slot him. I felt comfortable at 12, but again, he played great ball last year. The Lions are really coming together. And I don't really know much, much more to say than that because I just, it's, it's tough. Like I feel bad truly having him at 12. I feel like I'm discrediting him, but at the same time, it, there's just, there's other guys that had to be ranked above him. You know, it's tough. There's a lot of good quarterbacks in the league right now. So I get what you're saying and I have him at seven. So a little bit higher than you, but it, it really just depends on how you want to look at it. I'm looking at it as a fact of they kept their OC. They got Sam Laporta. I think Jamison Williams could possibly take a step this year. Um, I think after you get past Amon Raw and Jamison Williams, it gets a little thin in the wide receiver room. Now, obviously, you had Sam Laporta last year who kind of broke out, and then you have Jameer Gibbs who I think is going to take another step this year. Really good offensive line, and I think – in my opinion, you get another year in the system. So you can look at it one of two ways. Jared Goff either plays exactly like he did last year, which I think is one of the best, one of the top, you know, obviously seven quarterbacks in the league. Or you could look at it from a fact of, well, he'll still probably be good, but he may take, he may not take a step back, but defenses may figure him out a little bit more as we know. Um, oh my God, why am I blanking on the OC's name? You're not Ben Johnson. You, ben we just Johnson. haven't talked. We we haven't talked about him for a while. Yeah. You know, they didn't show for a little bit. I think we know that Ben Johnson kind of figured out what Jared Goff's flaws were after him after he came over from L.A. and kind of fixed them. So I think um, there's a lot of reasons why Jared Goff could even take another step this year and be better than he was last year. But I also see the reality where, you know, defenses do figure him out because as much as I do think Jared Goff is a great quarterback, I think his ability to adjust on the fly in season is is not the strongest i think he's one of those okay let me you know recoup for next year type of guy so with that being said i have jerry goff at seven dobbs what are you looking at at number 11 
All right. And at number 11, as I said, look, look, there's going to be a couple guys you could definitely argue that Jared Goff should be over. Let's start with one of them right here. At number 11, I got Mr. Brock Purdy. But again, you know what? Let me, you know, let me just explain. My, my logic on this is just look, you know, Brock has shown, yes, like, let, let it be clear. Let it be known. We've already acknowledged this. Everyone has the hell and back. Like, he has the, the best supporting cast you could ask for, right? He has the O-line all set. He has a fantastic receiving core. But we've seen that happen with a lot of players before. A lot of quarterbacks that get put into good situations, they don't make it work how Brock's been making it work. Brock's been making it work very well, very efficient, ball out on time, reading the field very well, putting the, right, just putting it where it needs to be, and he's reaping the benefits of it. Does he have a much easier situation than a lot of these guys? Yes. But on top of that, has he been playing exceptional ball and doing everything he has to do? Also, yes. So when you combine those two things, I felt like it was just, I didn't necessarily feel comfortable sneaking him into the top 10 yet just because these other guys are not working with what he's working with. But he's been playing fantastic ball, working with a lot. So I felt comfortable slotting him right outside the top 10. So I have him at number 12, so just one spot lower than you. And... Okay, so it's going to be very interesting. You take Ricky Pearsall at the end of the first round. There's been trade discussions around Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel. Now, as we get closer to the year, I find it harder and harder to believe that Ayuk is dealt, and it's probably going to be more Debo because I just don't think they're going to get what they're asking for when it comes to Ayuk. Um, but with that being said, I do think that they are going to... You know, I, I think Purdy is going to be Purdy this year. Like, I think he's going to be what people expect him to be. And I think that is a top 12 QB in my eyes. Um, but, and I know we've talked about this the last couple years, and it just is a reality more and more. And something that I, I think the way I've started to look at the NFL is if something is an issue, where you're usually a year too early on it. Like, Wait a year, and then it becomes the real issue. I think that is kind of the situation. I'm, I'm not saying their offensive line is an issue, but they haven't really addressed it. They they extended Colton McKivitz for a year through 2025, and then they drafted Dominic Pooney, which however you feel about him. But Trent Williams getting older, and like their interior is not bad, but it's not great. And I think what the 49ers have done, and it's all about, I guess, your team-building philosophy is they've – you know, they take a first-round wide receiver. They've invested in the skill positions on offense and have tried to supplement maybe the weakness. Um, not to say their O-line is weak, but, you know, some issues on the O-line. Like, they went skill over trenches. And, you know, it's worked for the 49ers. It, it has. But I guess my thing is, if you get to a point where you move on from Debo and you have Ricky Pearsall and you have... Ayuk, and then you have Kittle, Christian McCaffrey. Those are all going to be guys you can lean on. Purdy is elusive with his legs. So I think all I'm trying to say is Purdy himself can make this offense one of the best offenses in the league because he knows how to play on time. He knows how to play in the Kyle Shanahan system. My issue is when you have to pay him, and we've had this discussion, the line is getting a little bit older um, in terms of having the best left tackle in the league, you know, getting older. So I think they will be fine. And I think Purdy's going to put up really good numbers this year. I'm interested to see how it is going into the 2025 season. No. And I think again, everything you're saying is completely logical. There's definitely like, we're still early enough in the Brock Purdy era, the Brock Purdy saga that like, there will be some questions that have to be answered, but I think as you'd agree, you know, there's already been some questions that he's had to answer and he's answered them with resounding yeses with resounding. Look, you know what? I'm here to stay. So I don't have too much doubt really at this point that he's going to keep doing that. I guess the question is, what will the it, what will the fall off look like if there is any once he starts losing the talent he has around him now? But again, if he can keep proving that he still is the guy even when they lose certain pieces and he can replace them with him, like you're saying, with his with his talent and with what he does, well, he's just going to keep rising up this list as the years go right. on. But as of right now, I feel like 11 is pretty pretty you know safe and pretty comfortable for him. Uh, who do you have at number ten? For number 10, I have Jalen Hurts. And, you know, this is one that may be a little bit polarizing. And and why I say that is because if you're an Eagles fan, you're saying to yourself, hell no, Jalen Hurts is higher than that. But if you're not an Eagles fan, you're probably saying to me right now after last season, how do you have to still have Jalen Hurts so high? And, and to answer the question for both sides, you know, look, 
I think 10 for Jalen Hurts is about perfect. You know, if you told me a few years ago that Jalen Hurts was going to ever end up even being in the conversation for a top 10 quarterback, I would have thought that you, you know, would you, you were crazy. But sure enough, here we are a few years later. And look, after last year, yes, would he have been higher on this list? Absolutely. But, you know, last year there was definitely he's playing through injury and he's playing through bad coordinate, bad coordinator play. Those two things I have to put into put into consideration. When Jalen Hurts was healthy and when Jalen Hurts had good play calling, Jalen Hurts was electric and Jalen Hurts was making the Eagles, right, as we know, be a team that was literally a few plays away from being a Super Bowl champion. So Jalen Hurts is, is a great quarterback when he's healthy, when the play calling's there. However, when he has to do it all on his own, he can't do it all on his own, right? So with all that being said, I feel like number 10 was the perfect spot for him because he's proven he's the guy who can take you to the Super Bowl. He's a guy that you could win a Super Bowl with. They put up a lot of points. You know, Jalen Hurts is not the reason that they lost the Super Bowl by any means. So when you consider all those things, I feel like I couldn't have met anywhere lower than the top 10. But with the injuries and with not knowing what it's going to look like with new coordinator play, 10 is where I felt like it was perfect to slot him at. Yeah, I had him at number 11. And just to kind of echo your points, I mean, we talk about this a lot with Hurts. Like, he is the best when he had weapons or has weapons around him. And that's not anything bad by any means. Like, you never want to discredit a player for the opportunities that he's given. And if he takes advantage of those opportunities, well, that's what you wanted him to do. That's not really his fault. So, with that being said, I mean, you extend A.J. Brown, you extend Devonta Smith, you sign Saquon Barkley, you get your line, O-line taken care of in terms of extensions, and like we said, they fixed their offensive coordinator situation. They got Kellen Moore, and, you know, there has been kind of mixed feelings, in my opinion, on Kellen Moore. Now, he's definitely an upgrade from what they had, but I'm going to be very interested to see how this plays out with Kellen Moore this year, but it does feel like the Eagles really did try to address everything um, that they can. And I think, you know, people may agree with this. They may not agree with this. I think Jalen Hurts is a very good quarterback, and I think he knows what he needs to fix. I think he's a good leader. My thing is, if you want to analyze Jalen Hurts very honestly, if you want to look at pure just talent at the quarterback position – He's not a top five guy, but he can play like a top five guy with the way he runs the offense and distributes the ball. So right now, you know, I know from a optics standpoint, he didn't have the greatest year, but if you look at his stats from last year, they're not bad at all. So I think, you know, where you got him at 10 is perfect. I have him at 11. Uh, I think that's, I guess, the best summary I can give for Jalen Hurts. No, yeah, again. Very talented. He's just got to get healthy again. He's just got to get good, good play calling back around him. He can play anywhere within the range from 10 to 5. So I would agree with that 100%. Going into number 9, who do you have? I have Matthew Stafford here at number 9. And again, for Staff, there's really not too much to even say at this point. Matthew Stafford has proven, look, year after year, coming back from injuries, you know, he tough as nails. He can. He's a Super Bowl champion. He's proven he can go all the way. He, he has Sean McVay. I mean, really, what else is there to say? You know, this is a guy who he does it all. He does the no look passes. He runs the offense to you know to peak perfection when he's healthy, and he has a great core around him of guys that he's you know has a good repertoire with. He he made Puka Nakua into Puka Nakua. I mean, Matthew Stafford is is a great quarterback. And the reality is, you know, there was questions that came up a couple years ago, you know, a couple off seasons ago about the arthritis, this, that, and the third. I thought he was done then. You know, and Matthew Stafford has come and shown, look, I'm not done yet. I still got some left in the tank. And he's going to keep fighting until he has nothing left in the tank. That's his personality. That's who he is. I expect another good year from Stafford until the wheels fall off. Again, when are those wheels going to fall off? Because he's getting up there in age. I don't know necessarily. But until those wheels fall off, I just couldn't throw Stafford out of the top ten. No, I have – Stafford actually at five I am very high on him this year I think what they did last year I think another year of Puka um, will improve he'll improve even further obviously Cooper Cup I don't know if he's necessarily been the player that we want him to be and we heard the rumors kind of in the draft that the Rams were interested in Brock Bowers that kind of would have been pretty nuts um, but with that being said I mean you never doubt Stafford you never doubt McVay and I just think last year I think people were a little bit down on the Rams just going into the year, and they kind of proved us wrong. And I just think they improved on their roster, like, a lot. So I just don't see how 
another year in the system that Puka doesn't excel and the offense isn't better. You obviously add Blake Corum in the draft as well. And obviously this is about ranking quarterbacks, but in terms of who they have in the room, there's just so much more versatility. I think that allows Stafford to breathe a little bit easier. Um, obviously, you know, getting their guards signed and um, well, Jonah Jackson was signed. Uh, Kevin Dotson was extended, I believe. So, yeah, obviously upgrading the offensive line. So uh, that's why I have him at five. I just think kind of the sky is the limit for Matt Stafford and Sean McVay. No, yeah, again, you know, we we learned our lesson last year. We were, you know, we were down on the Rams. We learned our lesson. We're, we're careful about it. We learned quickly. We went into this year. We said we're not doubting the Rams again, right? It was our thing. We were talking about the over unders. You know, they they made it clear. Don't doubt us when McVay is here and Stafford is here. I learned. And that, that's all there is to say about that. You know, like, I'm, I'm going to stick with them. I'm going to ride with them if they're healthy. Going into number eight, Dobbs, who do you have? So I have C.J. Stroud at number eight. And again, you know what? I already can hear it. I already can see, hear the disgruntlement from Texans fans. But again, I'm objective, and I, I try to be as realistic as possible. We're like, here's the reality. By the end of this season, could C.J. Stroud make it very clear he's in that top five range or top six range and, and make it crystal clear where there's no argument and there's nothing else to be said? Absolutely. If he has another year like last year and can improve on it a little bit, I'm going to say to myself, all right, we're really starting to think that he's pushing top five, top six range. My thing is, though, I always have to, you know, I got to see it more than once. I don't, I can't just... It would be the Trevor Lawrence mistake. It would be a, it would be the prime example of, of the T-Law mistake. Like, I can't just take one year of you have playing really good and then just throw you right into the top five. Like, that's just not how it works. You know, like I, I got to see it more than once. I got to see that you can make adjustments after teams adjust to you. And let me be clear, you know, I think the CJ Stroud is gonna be able to do that just fine. I just couldn't make that leap without seeing it first. Right. Like that's really all there is to it. By the end of the year, I fully expect him to be anywhere within that five to six range. It's just for right now. I need to see, a, I need to see a little bit more consistently, even though, it was, even though it was consistent the whole year last year, I just need more than one year of sample size. I hope that that makes sense, Texans fans. I hope I didn't offend you guys too much. So I have CJ Stroud at four, but I completely understand what you're saying, Dobbs. Like, you don't want to make the jump too early because we see that these guys sometimes have sophomore slumps once defensive coordinators have had a year to kind of catch up with them. I think my main thing I took from watching CJ Stroud last year was when you watch him play, regardless of his stats, he just kind of has that like killer X factor. Like, you know, he has, you know, to be as corny as can be that dog kind of inside of him. Like, I think that's overused, but I think that's the best way to describe like the elite players in the league is yes. Kirk cousins can play like a top 10 quarterback, but does he have that like killer in him? CJ Stroud to me has that killer in him. Josh Allen, killer Joe Burrow killer Patrick Mahomes killer like that is what separates the top QBs in the lead league you go out you add Stefan Diggs Nico Collins had a breakout year last year now he gets to be the two then you get Tank Dell coming back after a rookie year and obviously he was hurt and shot but he looks like he's playing fine Dalton Schultz played well you upgrade with Joe Mixon you're gonna have a healthy offensive line I mean I may be crazy but it's possible. Does he take the number three spot? I mean, like, I think he could be a top three QB in the league this year. I have him at four. Obviously, it's not that big of a jump in my list, but I just think it's very possible that we see the ascension of Stroud this year. And I just really think the sky's the limit. See, I'm I don't know I don't know about top three this year, just because the guys that I have top three are so like they they've they've kind of like, you know, they've really worked their way into that range. They've really year after year, they've really earned that spot. But, but four to five, I think there's no doubt he can push himself into that four to five range. And you know what? What am I? Who am I to say, though? If C.J. Stroud goes out there, throws for like 5,100 yards, 40 <laughs> touchdowns, 10 interceptions, last, I'm going to say, you know what? He slot himself top three. Again, I, but do I think that's likely? Not really. But is it? Is it? I'll even say like 4,800, 4,900 yards. You know, so if he can push like 4,800, 40 plus touchdowns, all right, all of a sudden, he really might, and it, that is possible. It is very possible. It's just not likely. So I, like I said, I just want to, you know, but he, he, regardless, I do think is going to move up the list for me this year, no matter what. I just have to see it first before I, you know, before I make that leap myself. Uh, last point, and then we'll move on to your number seven. They did retain uh, Bobby Slovic. So year two with the same offensive coordinator. 
that's going to be huge for him as well. Moving into number seven, Dobbs, who do you have? All right. And so and let me crystal clear about this one, like crystal clear about this one. This same as CJ Stroud really wanted to have him higher. I would love, I really do think I'm going to say like, I do think that he is going to be so much better than who I have at number six long term. I think he's going to take who I have at number six's spot really quickly next year. But again, same thing as I just said about you know, CJ. I just I need more than one year of sample size before I can make the full leap. Like, OK, you're a top five guy. Right. So without further ado, yeah, Jordan Love, you know, it's just I, I, I the reality is just Jordan Love. It should be a top five, top six guy by the end of this year. It's you know, I just need to see another year of last year. But let's talk about last year with the receiving core that I didn't have tons of not not that I say not tons of faith in, but where that they were at in their career right now, I thought that there was going to have to be more development, more repertoire growing with Jordan Love before that we really started to see right fireworks kind of start to happen. Well, that wasn't the case, especially late in the season. They were making fireworks happen as young as they are, and they're young and they're growing together, bonding at that same age. I feel like that's kind of a very underrated thing where it's going to really help them. I, I expect a humongous year from Jordan Love this year. Again, I very well could have found a way to slide him into the top five. I just need to see another year of what I saw the second half of last year. If I see that again this year, there's no doubt Jordan Love is probably pushing himself into that top five, top six range. Just need to see it again, just to reemphasize, you know, same thing about, same thing as CJ Stroud. No, I get that. I think Jordan Love is going to be a very good quarterback for quite a while. And I think, you know, Christian Watson, if he remains healthy through the year, then you have Jaden Reed, who was a breakout as a rookie. You get Romeo Dobbs. Even Dontavian Wicks showed a lot of a lot of promise, and Malik Heath to some extent. You also have Musgrave and um, Tucker Craft, who are both rookies, and we know tight ends take a while to um, develop. You you add Jordan Morgan in the draft, and you have one of the better play callers in the league, and I think. Like you were saying, the sky is the limit for Jordan Love. You add Josh Jacobs to replace Aaron Jones, which, in my opinion, I, I don't know if you necessarily improve. I think it's kind of a wash. I just think you get a little bit more of a durability uh, factor because he is a little bit younger. Um, I am interested to see how, you know, kind of the line works out, right? Like, I want to see how their offensive line gels. It is young. Um, they lost David Bakhtiari, but I still think, you know, the Packers are known for their trenches. I have Jordan Love at nine. I think at his height, he can play like a top five quarterback. So with that being said, um, I think that's kind of, we need to see the second year um, after d defensive coordinators get a look at this guy. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Dobbs going into number six. Who do you have? All right. Controversy incoming. Again, I can already hear the comments on this one. I'm sorry. But again, look, he's one of those guys where the reality is Dak Prescott, he's just, he's in the overhated range. You know, like he's on, he has the target on his back. He plays for America's team. Like, right. The Cowboys have a lot of haters. We, so it's only right that Dak's going to have a lot of haters. But again, I only, tunnel vision, I only look at things objectively. Look, objectively, Dak was coming off the worst year of his career. And then he turned it into the best year of his career, right? Like he actually had a really good year last year, right? In structure, really making it work with the Mike McCarthy offense. Him and CeeDee Lamb have now developed a very, very elite connection. And again, you know, you lost some talent on the receiving core this year, but that's where now we're going to see what Dak is really kind of made of, right? We're going to see, okay, how, how much can Dak make up for it when they lose a little bit and he has to take a step forward. But again, after the step he took last year, there was a lot of pressure on his back. There was a lot of, you know, questions. If Dak has another year like he did last year, how much longer is this going to work in Dallas? Well, he showed up and he had a hell of a year. And I can't discredit him for that by any means necessary. And I feel like he has played at this point of his career many more good years than bad years. He's shown that he can do it more than once, you know, many times over now. So for all those reasons, felt comfortable saying, you know what, I'm putting him just above the guys that I think will pass him very soon in Jordan Love and C.J. Stroud. But it's just that Dak's done it for a little longer. He's done it more consistently because he, again, not, it's not to the other guys' discredit. The other guys just can't show the consistency yet. But I just had to give Dak the edge for those reasons. But again, you know, to be transparent, I do believe that he will fall down this list and we'll have other guys moving up as even the year goes along. This was just going into next year from what I have from last year. So I'm a little bit nervous for Dak Prescott this year. It, it is, you know, the extension talks have been going on and, you know, it is kind of like he needs to play really well if he wants to get paid like a top quarterback and remain in Dallas. 
and I don't know if the Cowboys are setting him up for success. You're not going to have much run game. Ezekiel Elliott is your wide receiver or running back one. And then CD Lamb is amazing. Yes, he's one of the best receivers in the league. But after he gets hurt, you have Brandon Cooks and Jalen Tolbert. Your offensive line, yes, you have Tyler Smith and you have Zach Martin. You know, Terrence Steele is okay. And then you get a project like Tyler Guyton. So you have a lot of questions on the offensive line. Your wide receiver depth is really thin. And you have an old, inefficient running back room. To me, that just screams that Dak Prescott is going to have a down year. And if you look at Dak Prescott's career, he very hilly. Good year, bad year. Good year, bad year. Good year, bad year. So while I think Dak Prescott is a very, very talented quarterback, I just don't see him be really playing higher than 10. I think he could drop back to 15. Obviously, this list is fluid um, because it's like not like, oh, this player is going to play like this. Just kind of going in, this is kind of where I see think he might play. So Dak Prescott at 10 for me is where I can see him at just with the circumstances of the team. Yeah, and again, nothing, nothing at all wrong with that. It makes plenty of sense. I just... He had a very good year last year, so I, 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 you know, kind of tailored my rankings more towards, like, what you immediately gave me last year with the history of what I know about you. But your point is very clear, yes, like, about Dak's history. It is hilly. So if if we go and have another hilly year, it's going to affect the I, – I can't really trust him to move him past 10 for a while after that. This is, this is Dak's last chance to stay in the top 10 on the lists. Going in to number five, Dobbs, who do you have? I have Justin Herbert. And, you know, again – after last year, there's probably a lot of people saying, you know, how could you, Justin, over some of these other guys? But again, you know, people are quick to forget. Justin Herbert, record-breaking, you know, fastest to, I don't remember the exact the exact stats, but the fastest to a lot of different accolades. He has truly been, you know, he's broken a lot of records, and he has been incredibly, in fact, historically productive the first, you know, seasons of his career. And yes, there's been a lot of turbulence in, over there in Los Angeles as well, right? Like a lot of turnover, new coaches, having to get used to new stuff. And I can't put that on him. When he's out there and he's just doing his thing, he's a guy with a top tier arm. And just there's stuff that you can't teach that Justin Herbert embodies, right? And I think it's stuff like that that pushes you into the top five range. I mean, the cannon he has and what he's shown he can do, even in not really super efficient offenses, I think once he gets his crew around him, which finally should be this Harbaugh regime, I feel like the Justin Herbert's the type of guy, the type of quarterback where he will hang around this top five range majority of his career. He just hasn't really had the consistency with the coaching staff to ever be able to really put together, right, where it starts to really get going and stay consistent and the health on top of it. If he can stay healthy and have a coaching staff that stays around him consistently, we already know this has been a fact. The sky is truly the limit for Justin Herbert, regardless of how you feel about the playoff loss a few years ago. Yeah, we can talk about all those other things. But from a talent perspective, from what he's shown us, the historical accolades, I felt like it would be wrong to leave Justin Herbert out of my top five. Yeah, I have him at number eight, and not because of anything that Justin Herbert uh, is capable of. I still think he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. I just look at their roster, and you got Ladd McConkey and Quinton Johnston um, as your number one and two receivers. And then, you know, Joshua Palmer's there. Don't love their tight end room. Don't love their running back room. They get Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins. Um, they drafted uh, Kamani Vidal, who a lot of people are high on. I just think that the Chargers are like one year away. And with the Greg Roman offense, I see them trying to run the ball a lot. So I just don't see the stats being there for Justin Herbert. I think he'll be a very efficient quarterback this year. But just with the way the roster is kind of shaped out this year, I don't think it's necessarily set up for a ton of success for Justin Herbert. So while I do have him at eight, I do think in 2025, he could probably be like a top five quarterback, no doubt. No, and I, I get that completely. They definitely are in terms of like them competing. They probably are about a year or two away. But, you know, just not, just for me, it was just on Justin's pure talent alone. I felt like I had to throw him in the top five. But I get where you're coming from as well. Number four, Dobbs, who do you got? Oh, right. And we know, you know, you know, if you're a listener, you know who we're getting down to now. You know, if, if it's your if your guys are left, you know, your guys are left. And it's a matter of who I put. But and it pains me because he's my guy. But I just felt like I couldn't put him any higher than four. We got Joe Burrow. And again, you know, obviously also the reality is too just though, coming off of an injury, 
I couldn't put him over the other three, you know, the other three, obviously, and certainly not over who is at one. That's no surprise to anybody. But Joe Burrow at four, very, I would say of any of all the ones that I made on this list, though, I actually think I'm the most comfortable with any of the any slot. I think I'm most confident and comfortable with Joe Burrow at four. Right. He's he's right outside the top three. But he definitely could find himself in that top three if he can just stay healthy again and have another fantastic year. He's right there. He's already shown us what he can do. Again, much like Jalen Hurts, a few snaps away from being a Super Bowl champion himself already this young into his career. Joe Burrow has shown he's the guy, right? He's he's a franchise guy. He will be until the wheels fall off, which hopefully is not for a very long time down the road in Cincinnati. But that's really just the bottom line. He's the guy, the franchise guy. He has the X-Factor killer like we were talking about earlier, right? He He doesn't... He does, it doesn't matter who's open. He's going to find the open guy. He has all the X factors skills that you want to have, the pocket presence, the mobility. Even though it's not like uh, the biggest highlight of his game, he can maneuver and make plays outside of that pocket, you know, just as good as anyone else. Not all being not like running plays, but just out of structure, he can make things happen with the best of them. So with all that being said, Joe Burrow at four, very comfortable with him slotted right there. Yeah, these top three are – you know, top four don't really necessarily need too much explanation. I have Joe Burrow at three. I think he possibly could run for the number two spot with Allen this year. Um, Just because the way the roster set up, obviously you have the tackle situation figured out your O line. Yes. You could probably use, uh, you know, an upgrade at one of the guard spots um, at left guard. But with that being said, you retain T. Higgins for the year. You get Jermaine Burton. You draft Eric All. So you're upgrading on your offense quite a bit. You sign Mike Gusecki, Drew Sample, Tanner Hudson. Obviously, none of those guys really move the needle a ton. But Gusecki is not, you know, just a scrub. Like, he can play ball. Uh, I think their offense is set up pretty well. I do like Zach Taylor. I think as long as Burrow can stay healthy, and that is the biggest contingent um, because we've seen he cannot stay healthy all the time. Um, but when he does, he is one of the best quarterbacks in the league. I think this this year is set up perfectly for the Bengals to make a run at the Super Bowl and Joe Burrow to maybe have one of his best seasons yet. Oh, absolutely. If he can, if Joe Burrow can just come back healthy, type of type of guy, type of mentality where he will, even if the stats don't show it, he's going to get sharper every single year. We just need him to stay healthy and stay out there. Who do you got at number three, Dobbs? Number three, I have Josh Allen. And um, you know, and if you you know who the top two are now, if you you know if you if you've been paying attention, you know who my top two are now. But we'll get into that soon. Yeah, Josh Allen at three. You know, the reality is this: it was very hard to debate between him and who I have at two, right? But for me, the reality kind of just came down to with Josh. There is still moments where you're like, all right, dude, like you know, what are you doing? Like, why why did you force that? But let me be clear, because I'm starting off negative when I shouldn't. Uh, besides those moments, it's it's all positive, right? It's like a guy who, like you said earlier, we're just gonna it's theme of the show now. Straight dog in him. He will make a play for his team whenever he needs to. He will put that team on his back, hard running, slam in shoulders into other shoulders. Like Josh Allen is a guy who he's playing to win, right? There's no doubt about that. Every time he takes that field, he's playing to win. Fantastic outside of the pocket. Really good, really good in the pocket as well. Cannon for an arm. He had he has everything you want. He has everything you want in a franchise quarterback. There was no way I could put him outside of the top three. And I think he's going to be one of the main guys who's going to be having an MVP campaign this year. So with all that said, yeah, I just I couldn't leave him out of my top three. Like I said, him and Joe Burrow, you know, like we were saying, it's kind of like right there. But after Joe Bre- after Joey B's injury last year, it was easy. Josh Allen number three was very comfortable with it. Yeah, I have Josh Allen at number two. I just think you know it's hard because I could see him not be he, I, he'll be a top five quarterback no matter what but I can see him having kind of a down year I mean Khalil Shakur Keon Coleman Curtis Samuel like those are your top three you obviously have Dalton Kincaid as well but you kind of lose that top option with Stefan Diggs I don't know if Keon Coleman is ready to be that number one now I think Shakir is going to take a big step this year And obviously, James Cook has made advancements as well. Their offensive line is fine. I think, you know, going another year where you kind of are getting a little bit more acquainted with Ken Dorsey as the OC after they made the change last year to fire um, their their OC midseason, I think that'll be beneficial. But Josh Allen, with what he can do with his legs, what he can do with his arm, I just think you can never kind of leave him out as a top three QB. 
Yeah, no, he he he's truly solidified himself at this point where unless he has either an egregious fall off, which I don't think is going to happen with losing Stefan or God forbid an injury, he's going to keep himself in that top three, top four range for a very long time going forward. Bills right. fans, you know, you have you have one of them. So who do you have a two Dobbs? I'll write it number two. I think there's a little bit of polarization for us between the between where I have him and where you have him. So it'll be good yeah. discourse. But look, I, I have Lamar at number two. And let, let me just start off with by saying this. If we were talking pure quarterbacking, nothing outside of the pocket, right? Lamar would be somewhere like five to six. But what he does and how he changes the way you have to game plan and what he does with his legs, on top of the fact that he is, he's gotten very good in the pocket, he's become very good in structure, he's just a terror, right? Two-time MVP, we, there, there, there's the accolades show it, right? Like this is a guy who really at this point, you know, he's already a future Hall of Famer no, really almost no matter what at this point he, in such a short career. If Lamar finds a way, which I do believe he will at some point in his career, to finally, you know, put that Lombardi on his shoulder at the parade and say, I'm the guy, there's really no doubt he's number two at this point. He's just got to really, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like he, he's he's established himself like, look, you, I, I am a guy who's an X factor. And when you play at my team, I'm the number one focus. That's the reality of the situation with Lamar nowadays. There's no, there's no, there's no easy way to guard Lamar. You could have the best game plan in the world, and it's still going to be a very tough matchup, right? So for all those reasons, I just felt like I couldn't put Lamar any lower than two because obviously we all know who we're all going to have at one. But I feel like Lamar is about as hard to game plan for as number one without being number one, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason I have him at number six is okay. The biggest argument is that. Lamar has really never been given the weapons to succeed, right? So they get OBJ last year, okay. Then they lose him. And now you're in the same exact situation you were in last year or the year before. So I guess, yes, you have Mark Andrews, you know, coming off the injury. And then you have Zay Flowers, Rashad Bateman, take it or leave it. And then Nelson Aguilar. You add Derrick Henry. But with that being said, you have more question marks on the offensive line. So while I do think Lamar is still going to be productive and have a better season, obviously it's year two with the OC now, Todd Munkin. I just think they're going to take, he is just not going to be, I just don't, I'm not buying the Ravens offense this year. Let's just say that. I am not buying the Ravens offense and I think, things will be a little bit tougher for Lamar because of the receiving options and because of the downgraded offensive line. So with that being said, that's why I have Lamar at six, which is nothing to scoff at. That's still a top six quarterback out of 32. No, absolutely. Again, I completely understand your reasoning as well, though. I definitely do. So Dobbs at number one, I think it's fairly obvious. We both have Patrick Mahomes. Um, Dude, what do you mean? What do you mean, bro? You, you're going to tell me that it wasn't? I'm blanking on his name out. I, I was going to make a joke. Well, I was going to say, you're telling me it's not Nathan Peterman, dude? Like, No, I, I actually, I was struggling to put uh, Bo Nix there, but no, it's just, I don't know. Like, it, it always, I always feel bad. for. I, I don't feel bad for Chiefs fans, but whenever you're listening to a podcast, and obviously, like, whenever I listen to, like, PFF or, like, um, the athletic football show. And I mean, it helps a little bit because uh, Adam Mays is a Bears fan, but I always hate when they like kind of glaze over my team after I've lift listed to pretty much every other team and they'll talk for super long. And that's how I kind of feel like it is for chiefs fans. A lot of the time is because when you get to list like this and they get to Patrick Mahomes, it's like, well, yeah, it's Patrick Mahomes. Like he's number one. Like, I don't know what there is to say, but in reality, like what is there to say? He is the best quarterback. He has three rings they've upgraded at receiver they have drafted a left tackle Kingsley Suamatia so I, I don't know like even if Rashi Rice is not there for half the season like they still have Hollywood Brown and Xavier Worthy Travis Kelsey Isaiah Pacheco so I, I just don't know what there is to say other than Patrick Mahomes is obviously the best quarterback in football well, I think Chiefs fans would agree it's a good thing there's not much to say in this you know it, when you're in a situations like this You'll take it, right? I, and again, you know, as a Saints fan, look, I hear you loud and clear, bro. I know how this. You know, I'm, a, I'm a small market fan. My team, my team gets glazed over on any show or any podcast I try to watch about them, right? So I know that feeling. But Chiefs fans, it's good for you guys, right? Like it's good when you're you're just on top and you're rolling. There's not really much to say. 
But I'll say this. I will, I'll give you the explanation. You know, Chiefs fans, I'll give you the explanation in detail real quick, right? We're talking about a guy who consistently looks off defenders and puts the ball pinpoint without looking even where he's throwing the ball. We're talking about a guy who's so good in the pocket, he, just like Tom Brady, he legitimately feels pressure without even having his head turned that way. He just has such game sense that he knows when the pressure is coming. He, the, the ball arrives so fast, but so catchable for 95% of his targets that he just makes it easy on the receiver. He, the receiving core was heavily upgraded. Uh, the offensive line, still a very productive unit as it was last year. The reality of the situation is that's Mahomes, man. Like Mahomes is just, there's nothing to say. He does little things that nobody else does at a level he does as elite as he does. And on top of that, he has the best arm in the entire league. How could how could you make a better quarterback than Patrick Mahomes? That that's really the explanation in detail. You know, you, we could do the non-detailed version. We could do the detailed version. The reality is, Patrick Mahomes is clearing away the number one quarterback in the league. And if you were to argue that, you are certainly not in a sober mind. <laughs> Well, that is the top 15 for the quarterbacks. We are now going to be moving in to the